the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. Um, also, if you happen to be watching online or if you're here this morning and you're wondering about how you can give to support the church, we don't pass a plate. Um, we just have the boxes in the back. If you feel the Lord leading you to uh, donate towards uh, the ministry of the church, you can do that by dropping your donation in one of those boxes. As always, I'll prefer for you to give uh, with a joyful heart, um, certainly not out of compulsion. So just as the Lord leads, uh, please do give. Um, and uh, if you're watching online, you can uh, go up to the right side of the, the website, and uh, there you will find links to give online as well. All right, so this morning we are continuing our study through Mark chapter 1. And I don't know why I'm in Mark 7 in my Bible. Let me back up here. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time. I know I, I had a lengthy introduction last week. We're going to do the same thing this week. Um, not the same exact introduction, but because that would be weird. But, but some, of, some of the same, same ideas we're going to talk about, because I don't think I voiced myself very well um, when I went over some things. And I just want to make sure that uh, that everything is clear, um, because I I don't treat uh, I don't treat you guys like like children who who are needing milk. Um, I, I treat you guys like believers who want the meat of the word. Um, so there are things sometimes that I get into that are pretty lofty. Um, it might be hard to understand, or might even uh, possibly stretch you. Um, depending on what you have uh, been taught before, might might uh, come up against that some. Uh, so I, I do want to spend a little bit of time discussing this idea of uh, the good news um, that we see in various forms in Scripture. So we'll do that for a little while. And then we're also going to uh, get into uh, the history of what... what, what uh, the culture, what the climate was like, the world, the the climate in Israel at the time when when Mark, uh, in the time that Mark was writing about, not when he wrote this. We we went over the history, um, what it was like in Rome at the time Mark was writing this. Um, but I want to back that up so you have an idea of of what what was kind of going on uh, in context, in, in absolute context with the text that we're studying here. So we'll get into uh, Herod and and some of those things real quick before we dig into the Word. Now, we didn't make it all the way, uh, I think we made it to verse 8 last week, um, so we'll, we will be picking up with verse 9 of Mark 1, but I do want to take a little bit of time to kind of go over some stuff and hopefully do a better, more thorough job this morning uh, with some things that I did last week. Um, we spent a good deal of time last week talking um, about the word gospel and its various contexts in Scripture. Um, the word gospel, as you guys I'm sure remember and have probably heard well before I even mentioned it to you, but it comes from that old English word good spell, meaning good news or glad tidings. Um, it is a translation of the Greek word evangelion um, or good message. Now, this Greek word is used 77 times in the New Testament, and it's used speaking of various things having to do with good news. Um, it's used in reference to the, the gospel of grace. Um, it's used in reference to what is known as the gospel of the kingdom. It's 
uh, used uh, just kind of in general for, for somebody bringing somebody else just good news of, of any unspecific kind. Um, it's also used in reference to the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. So it's used a number of ways in Scripture. We find the phrase, the gospel of the kingdom, used often during Jesus' early ministry and, and prior to his death and resurrection and ascension. Um, but then we don't find it used afterwards. And the reason for that is that the gospel of the kingdom uh, refers to the good news that Messiah King Jesus himself is present in Israel and ready to give Israel her kingdom. And for this reason, the disciples, and, and uh, after Jesus was, was resurrected, asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist was a forerunner. He was, a, he was there preparing the way for Israel to receive Jesus as her Messiah and King, as both their physical and their spiritual Savior. There were times such as recording the Gospel of John, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, then the text says, but he departed again to the mountains by himself alone. Now, he departed alone and he had his disciples take the boat without him toward Capernaum. And then we have the whole, uh, the, the, I, that time when Jesus walked on the water to come out and, and rescue the disciples in that storm. So, wouldn't that then be good news that they wanted to make him king? Um, well, you know, the, the sentiment was fine, but the timing was not. The crowd's desire to have Jesus as its king was based on physical, not spiritual considerations. As Jesus later explained, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They, they had more than just physical needs. They had spiritual needs. But they were not believing Jesus. They were enthralled by the miracles. We see many people today who are, go from church to church chasing after signs, yet not believing Jesus. It seems to be a common problem of people throughout the ages. God told Israel time and again that they were stiff-necked, they were rebellious, they were idolatrous. And judgment was coming for Israel if they did not repent. Would that description have fit anyone alive at that time? Absolutely. And still today. Also, many born-again believers today, but Israel were the covenant people of the Lord. They were people of the law, and the law meant blessings by keeping the law and cursing by breaking the law. Israel were also promised a kingdom, but that blessing could not come to a rebellious Israel. They needed to believe Jesus. So that the kingdom of heaven was at hand was a reference to the kingdom promised to Israel by God, which was in the text, now at hand, if they repented of their sins, such as their rebellion and their idolatry, and they received Jesus as their king. So John is telling them to repent. Now, John's use of repentance is one of those things that I think tends to trip some people up. Repentance in Scripture is usually viewed in, in one of two ways. One view is that repentance is a change of mind concerning someone or something, and is often used synonymously with faith. Um, in this view, it's never stated as a condition of eternal life, but it rather speaks of coming to believe the facts of Jesus. Another view is that repentance is a decision to turn from one's sin in order to get right with God. And this was the case here. John was calling for a repentance that was to be accompanied by a change of conduct. 
John was calling the nation of Israel, John the Baptist was calling the nation of Israel to turn from her sins in preparation for the coming kingdom. So what I want you guys to understand is that John is not saying that this change of conduct is necessary for receiving eternal life. John was speaking of the immediacy of the kingdom that they, if Israel should, should repent. I hope everyone gets that, and I think you do. My concern is that, that someone might be thinking that I, I'm trying to say that there are multiple ways that someone can be saved from eternal condemnation, and I am not. Someone could be told, perhaps by a teacher, I have good news. You turned your grades around significantly. You have improved dramatically. That same person might also be told, I have good news. You have been accepted to, I don't know, Harvard University. Still yet, that same person, after being accepted into Harvard, might receive more good news. You're being awarded a scholarship. All of those things are good news, but they are all slightly different. Still, they're all also related. The word gospel means simply good news, and good news is used in, in the scripture in several ways. In fact, if you were to do a word study of evangelion or gospel, this is what you would find, and we've got screenshots we'll put up for you. Gospel of Jesus, good news, gospel of the kingdom, and so on. Interestingly enough, the gospel of John is the one gospel that is declared by the author to be evangelistic. Yet the word gospel does not occur anywhere in John's gospel, except, of course, in the title. In the synoptic gospels, it's used to refer to the announcement to Zechariah by an angel uh, of the good news of the, the soon-to-be birth of his son. Um, the word evangelion, which is that same Greek word translated gospel or good news, glad tidings, is used by the angel Gabriel in reference to John the Baptist. And not Jesus in Luke 1.19. The announcement to shepherds by an angel concerning the birth of Christ is used there. And the announcement by Jesus of the good news that the kingdom was at hand is used there. Other than that, the other 12 uses of the word gospel in the synoptics are left unexplained. However, in regard to those 12 uses that are kind of outside and left unexplained, it would not make sense that they refer to the very specific good news of the birth of John the Baptist, or even the birth of Jesus. They most naturally refer to the other good news, explicitly mentioned in the synoptics, the good news of the kingdom, that is, the, that the kingdom was near and the Messiah was here. And Israel needed to repent and receive her Messiah. Eternal life is a free gift. Even as Paul wrote in Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And by the way, that phrase, the gift of God, in that sentence, is not the faith. The sentence structure in Greek has the gift of God being, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's the salvation, it's the gift of God. For an individual Jew to receive eternal life, at that time and today, all that was required was simple faith, in the promise of God to grant eternal life through faith in his Messiah. And it's the same for Gentiles. Salvation has been by grace through faith all along. And it is the only way. Of course, our text for the time being is dealing primarily with Israel and not with Gentiles. And that will start to change as we work our way through the text of, of Mark. So while John the Baptist was preaching that Israel must repent for the kingdom is at hand, he also asked those who hear his message to believe Jesus. We see this clearly in the words of Paul in Acts 19.4. John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who could come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, 
in, in, in pulpits for the past several hundred years or more, very often the preaching of John the Baptist that was specifically for Israel has been carried over and added to Jesus' proposition of John 3.16, whoever believes. And I think that replacement theology, um, the unbiblical teaching that the church has replaced or superseded Israel, and God has now rejected Israel and placed all the promises he gave to Israel on the church, I think that terrible theology has clouded this issue and resulted in additional confusion. Anyway, I think, I think then you can see the problem. When repentance is, is taught as synonymous with faith, it becomes a condition. It becomes a condition of eternal life, and that makes it contrary to the very words of Jesus. And Jesus himself, time and again, gave only one condition for eternal life, which was believe. Speaking with Nicodemus about salvation, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Speaking to Martha, Lazarus' sister, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? To the previously blind man, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Many times in Scripture, when talking about salvation from spiritual condemnation, Jesus had the opportunity to require repentance and belief. But every time, Jesus simply says, believe. Even in John 3, in which we have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. After, the, after verse 16 of that same chapter, he says, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is already condemned, or condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The word repent is not even found in the one intentionally evangelistic gospel that is John's gospel. Nor is it found in Paul's defense of the gospel in the book of Galatians. Now it's very odd if God requires us to perform this work of, of taking physical steps to change our conduct and then to believe. Now, are other words that Christians often associate with one meaning, or there are other words that Christians often associate with one particular meaning when they don't have just one particular meaning? And some of these might surprise you. Judgment. It's important to know when Scripture is speaking of judgment here on earth, such as Israel being taken into captivity by Babylon, or Jerusalem being sacked and burned by Rome, is it speaking about earthly judgment, physical, temporal judgment, or is the text speaking of eternal judgment for sins? We have judgment used in both senses in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, salvation is another. It's used in Scripture to speak of salvation from judgment here on earth, what we might call earthly judgments for, for sin. And it's also used to speak of judgment of believers' works as to how that believer enters the kingdom with rewards or perhaps with loss of rewards. And it's used to speak of judgment for those who reject Jesus and will be judged for their evil deeds and suffer spiritual death in hell. There, there are many more words like that in Scripture. Words like faith, lost, grace, hell. Words that are used a myriad of different ways in Scripture. But we are conditioned to think of them in one particular way. And we quickly apply that way that we're conditioned to think of them. We might call it our preferred way of, uh, our preferred definition, I should say. We place it upon the word. Um, which is inappropriate for the text. Um, I mean, you can imagine the original author. I mean, if you if you sit down and you write a letter to somebody and um, you know you send that letter to them, you don't expect them to read that letter and and define the words according to what they want the words to mean. They should mean what you wrote to them. 
Gospel, salvation, rewards, baptism, judgment. These are all themes that we're going to encounter throughout our study through Mark. And when we do, we'll take that time because I don't want to just bottle feed. I want to provide a Brazilian feast. I don't know, what, what do you call that? Where they bring out, out the skewers and all that, yeah. I, of the word, I want you guys to be full. Sometimes you might get overly full, and but that's just what happens sometimes. So, um, does it surprise you? It might. It might surprise you to know that the authors of the various books of the Bible had a reason for writing. They they deliberately chose to use certain words because they wanted to convey what they wanted the reader to understand. Inspiration is one of those words that gets misunderstood a lot. I mean, doesn't that mean that the Holy Spirit took control of the authors in order to produce this text? I might surprise you to learn that the doctrine of inspiration does not hold that the biblical writers were you know, being animated or controlled. That's not the case. It's actually, it's actually far better than that. What the doctrine means is that the words the authors communicated were the words the Holy Spirit intended to use to accurately convey God's message to man. Picture the biblical writers as being kind of borne along as a a sailboat is by the wind. The rudder is still there. It's still in their hands. They still wrote with intent. It was that they were empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we have in Scripture that which God wants us to or wants us to know what God wanted the Scriptures to say. That means the authors had a reason for writing and for using the vocabulary that they used, whether to teach or to motivate or or record or to promote a certain point of view or deliver a revelation that they had received. So then biblical inspiration is God's superintendence of the human authors, so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded his revelation to man just as God intended in the words of the original autographs. Now, original autograph simply means the original physical text penned by the authors, which have been translated from the original languages over thousands of years past. So the truth of inspiration is that God superintended but not dictate the material. And secondly, he used human authors writing in their own individual styles for reasons. And the end result was, in its original manuscripts, without error, and able to do what God intended As God intended. Now, if we are going to be faithful students then of God's word, don't we need to avoid imposing our own meaning on the text? I believe so. What we do is, to the best of our ability, seek to understand what the author originally intended to convey. That means we want to understand how he used the very words he chose to use. And so then we don't take the meaning of a word as it means today. What what a word means today, we don't take that and try and apply it to the words the authors used several thousand years ago. Instead, we use the meaning the words conveyed at that time. And that is also a part of keeping Scripture in proper context. So this is, why, this is why I get very nuanced um, when it comes to the text of Scripture. Um, I, I, my desire is to, to rightly divide the word of truth, um, as Paul instructed. But that cannot happen if we're trying to apply improper context. In fact, that, that's just, that is so sloppy and, and it's very self-serving. Um, now I promise we're going to get into the text, but first... Last week, we looked at those historical events that occurred up to, during, and after the time of the writing of this gospel in terms of the Roman Empire, Israel, and the early church. 
But something we did not look at was current events during the time um, the recorded events of this letter were actually happening. So let's do that now. Jesus was born between 6 BC and 4 BC. And given the clues we have in Matthew, it was probably around late August or early September. Rome was ruling over Israel, and Herod was appointed over Judea by Rome. He was a little man, only about four foot four, but he was a great builder. Among his building accomplishments was the renovation and the expansion of the temple and its grounds. He also built the fortress, uh, fortresses Masada and Herodian, as well as the seaside city of Caesarea Maritima. Now, Herod was born in the 70s BC. Herod, like his father Antipater, were both loyal to Rome. Antipater was an advisor in Rome and had a, a lot of sway with the officials there. This allowed Herod to receive a governorship in Galilee at age 25. But his father was assassinated. Herod then fl- uh, fled to Rome, where he was then officially crowned king of Judea. And then he returned in 39 BC and regained control of the land for the next 33 years. Now, Herod was not Jewish. He was an Edomite, a descendant of Esau. And over the course of his rule, he became worried that he was going to lose his kingdom. He built his fortresses um, because of this paranoia and would go to them for refuge whenever he felt like his rule was threatened. His growing paranoia also was reflected in his murder of his own sons. He sent them to a city not far from Caesarea and uh, with orders for them to be strangled there. Herod had ten wives, one of which was Jewish. He married her in an attempt to, to gain approval with the Jewish population that he ruled over. He had her parents put to death and later had her and more sons put to death, suspicious that they were after his kingdom. So this is the man known as Herod the Great, the one who was Rome's puppet king of Judea at the time of Jesus' birth. And this is the same Herod that had the children put to death while trying to kill Jesus upon hearing from the wise men of Babylon that the prophesied king of the Jews had been born. But by the time Jesus was baptized, which is where we are here in the text of Mark chapter 1, Herod Antipater was king. And this is, this is the Herod that appears most often in the New Testament. Herod was technically not a king, but a tetrarch, a, a ruler with a, a rank and authority lower than a king. A tetrarch ruled only with the approval of the Roman authorities. This was roughly equivalent to being governor of a particular region. Um, in the New Testament, Herod uh, there was Herod who ruled over Galilee, and he's called a king, but this reflects just the popular usage rather than an official title. So Herod ruled the region of Galilee between 4 BC and 39 AD, and in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Herod, uh, uh, did I say Annie Potter earlier? Uh, Herod, uh, Annie Potter's attitude toward Jesus is somewhat vague and indecisive. It probably doesn't matter because Annie Potter, Annie Potter. You know, whatever. But one, one, we don't know a whole lot here in the text of Mark, but even just reading the text, we get kind of this impression that there is this danger, there's this lurking danger already for Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, we'll see how the Herodians, that is, uh, people who were in favor of Herod and, and Herod's policies, um, they get together and they counsel about how to kill Jesus. Now, this Herod was not the builder that his father Herod the Great was. Um, He he certainly did found cities, and and he he built uh, a few theaters, uh, Sepphoris and and, uh, one in Tiberias. Um, The building projects were relatively small compared to to, uh, later Roman period structures that that can be seen there today. Um, He even only minted a relatively few coins, but in doing so, he was always careful with the imagery he put on the coins. Um, He he put on those coins imagery that wouldn't be offensive to his Jewish subjects. Now, archaeology of first century sites has shown that while a few were terribly poor, 
most people were able to at least scrape by. And under Herod and, and Herod, uh, Herod the Great and, and Herod the Son, the economy was actually doing fairly well. However, Rome was heavily taxing the people. Tax collectors were allowed to take more than uh, was owed in order to build their own fortunes. Um, so that's kind of the situation in, in Israel at this time. And it's generally accepted that Jesus' ministry lasted for three years, the first year of which um, is not really fully uh, covered in the Synoptic Gospels. So, all right, that should be enough. Let's, let's pray, and then we'll dig into the text of the Word. Lord, as we embark on the study of your Word, we just ask, Father, that you would open our hearts to receive your Word and your instruction, um, that we would understand what you desire to say to us through your Word. Um, we want to be hearers. We want to be doers. We ask that you would lead us in all of your ways, for your ways are good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so starting with verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So unlike the other synoptics, here in Mark we're introduced to Jesus when he came from Nazareth of Galilee to where John was baptizing at the Jordan River. Whereas he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus was raised in Nazareth. So Nazareth was the place where he spent his childhood and where he lived and worked until he set off on his ministry. Um, the primary focus of his ministry would be the area of Galilee. But he will be back in Nazareth later as his ministry starts to shift more and more towards the Gentiles. Very little is known about Jesus' childhood. The Bible is mostly silent about it. Um, we have some brief glimpses in the Bible or in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Um, in verse 40, it says, The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We also know from Luke 2 that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Um, presumably, they took Jesus with them each year. Luke says that there was this one time when, Jesus, uh, when, when his parents lost Jesus while in Jerusalem for Passover, and when they found him, he was uh, in the synagogue sitting in the midst of the teachers, uh, listening and asking questions. He was only 12 years old, but Luke tells us that all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now, aside from this, the Bible does not reveal much more of, of Jesus' childhood, but I think we can safely make some assumptions. Jesus grew up in a good home with, with parents who loved him. Jesus was fulfilling the duties of an eldest son. Luke says that Jesus was subject to his parents, meaning he was obedient to them. Um, it seems that Joseph died sometime earlier when the family was young. We know from the Gospels that Jesus had siblings, younger siblings, brothers and sisters. Jesus is referred to, as, uh, to in Matthew 13 as son of the carpenter. So Joseph was, uh, the Greek word is a tecton, usually translated as carpenter, but not exclusive of uh, uh, of just wood, perhaps working with stone, or even perhaps with some metals, Jesus would certainly have learned to work um, in his father's vocation. So it's safe to assume that with the passing of Joseph, that is with, um, with the father of the family now gone, Jesus, as the eldest son, then would have stepped in and worked to support his family. He probably taught his brothers carpentry as well. So for a season, Jesus accepted the simple duties of the home. Jesus did not come into a cushioned life. He worked as a, a carpenter, perhaps a mason again. He would have worked hard, performed tedious and menial tasks. He lived the simple life of a regular person. And through this, he identifies then also with you and I, just the regular people. So in the silent years, Jesus lived as the way that we would, only he lived without sin. Faithful, even in the little things. Scripture does not say it quite this way, but having passed on, on his earthly father's vocation to his brothers, there came a day when uh, he, set, he, he set all of that aside to do what his heavenly father sent him to do. And now, in our text, he is with John at the Jordan. John the Baptist was preaching about the Messiah, who was now with them. 
and preparing the people for the beginning of Christ's ministry. Paul, uh, or part of that was, was his ministry of baptism, John's ministry of baptism. John was called the Baptist not because that was his last name. That's just what he did. That was part of his ministry. He proclaimed the need for repentance so that Israel could receive the kingdom, and he baptized people in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. This was a baptism of declared repentance, but Jesus was in all ways without sin. So he could not repent of anything. So why did Jesus do this? How was this applicable to Christ himself? Well, first, it of course demonstrated his approval of John's ministry and John's baptism. Secondly, it allowed John the Baptist to fulfill his ministry by pointing to him, to Christ, as the Lamb of God, the one who he had been preaching of and preparing the people to receive. So John was presenting Jesus to the people as their Messiah. And also, John was of the priestly line. He was of the tribe of of Levi and a direct descendant of Aaron. It was a duty of priests to wash and to present sacrifices before the Lord. The Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 28, tells us that John was baptizing at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Also known as Bethabra beyond the Jordan. This was the same area in the wilderness um, at the Jordan River where Israel would have first crossed over into the promised land. Now, Mark is really, he's really compressing the baptism of Jesus. So if if you want to read more about the baptism, you can go to Matthew chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, or John 1. And there's a a lot more to this. uh, It it expands on the events of this happening. Um, But Mark really condenses it just to this one thing. So, in contrast to the people, Jesus had no sense to confess at his baptism. His baptism uh, distinguished him as the coming one to identify with the sins of the people and to be anointed by the Spirit. Verse 10. And immediately coming up from the water... He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice heard at the baptism of Jesus is of great importance. On three occasions, the Father spoke from heaven. We have him speaking at this time of Christ's baptism. At the transfiguration, as recorded in Matthew chapter 17, and as Christ approached the cross, as recorded in John 12. Now, speaking of what the Father says here, it echoes Psalm 2. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are my son. But the second part is left off. And that is because, as we know from Acts 13, his begetting refers to his resurrection from the dead. And so, we find that this statement from the Father ties in perfectly with the picture painted in baptism of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But the Father's statement also relates Jesus Christ to the suffering servant that was prophesied in Isaiah uh, chapters 40 through 53. Humble, rejected, made to suffer and die, but also victorious. And we should also note that here at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, we have the full representation of the Holy Trinity. We have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. Now you would think that everyone there would, at that moment that God spoke, have just dropped everything to follow Jesus. But instead we find Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness alone to endure temptation. Verse 12, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness I don't know what kind of car it doesn't say. I'm kidding. Um, Drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness, 40 days tempted by Satan, and was there and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So the text here gives us a time frame of 40 days 
But from the synoptics, we know it was 40 days and 40 nights. All right? and it's Cutting hairs a little bit, but just so you know. We also know from the synoptics that during those 40 days and nights, Jesus fasted. Um, fasting is, is the, the Greek word uh, nustevo, meaning going hungry, and it speaks of depriving oneself of food for a set time. But scripturally, the purpose of fasting is not the avoidance of food. It's to take one's focus off of the things of this world in order to focus completely on the things of God. Jesus was preparing. He was probably considering his ministry as it would be and what would come and praying to the Father. If you're looking for a meal, now the Judean wilderness is not the place you go. If you're, going to, if you're looking to fast and to be alone, it's the perfect spot. Jesus was not the only one recorded in the Bible to fast. Exodus 34 records that Moses, while receiving the Torah, fasted on top of the mountains. Um, and in 1 Kings 19, we have uh, recorded that Elijah fasted for 40 days and nights while running from Jezebel. And why this 40 days and nights? In fact, what is it with this number 40 in the Bible? There always seems to be this kind of, this kind of ushering in of some kind after a 40-day event in the Bible. We have the rains for 40 days and nights in the time of Noah. Uh, Moses on the mountain for 40 days and nights, twice. Um, we have Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, before Samson's deliverance, Israel served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David arrived to kill him. And Jesus remained on earth 40 days after his resurrection. After each of these periods of time, there was something new that was ushered in. But others look at those things from another point of view and see the number 40 speaking of testing or judgment. Either way, the repeated appearance of 40 throughout the Bible seems to have some significance. But of what? I don't know. That's because the Bible never specifically tells us what the repeated 40s mean. Now, my own preference in regards to this is that Israel was led through the wilderness for 40 years because, um, because they failed at Kadesh Barnea. And so Jesus further identified then with the sins of the Jewish people by spending one day in the wilderness for each year Israel had spent wandering. However, it, it, it's a case that sometimes a number in the Bible is just simply a number. Even repeated numbers, including the number 40. And sometimes large numbers are given, not intending to be a specific number, but instead these large numbers are given just to, to communicate that there's this large amount of something in general. Kind of like we might say, um, I ate a ton of food this morning. You didn't eat a ton. Pretty sure. <laughs> but it's, it's just a, it's a, a way of speaking that, that we find sometimes in the Bible. And we find a lot of these kind of linguistic tools used in the Bible. Sometimes people look at these things and they, they don't recognize that a linguistic tool is being used and they, they, they take it way beyond what the Bible intended. So we, we need to be careful with numbers. They're interesting. Um, but sometimes they can become just a distraction. Um, it is very easy to get bogged down in mysteries in the Bible because there, there's a lot of stuff out there that's very, very interesting. Uh, a lot of very cool mysteries in the text of Scripture. Um, what is not a mystery is uh, that believing Jesus, you're saved. So it's important to keep the important things in the forefront and not get distracted by the little things. Now, there's plenty of truth in the plain words of Scripture. There's enough there to meet all of our needs and, and to make us, as Second Timothy 3 puts it, completely and thoroughly equipped for every good work. We might think that, that Jesus, being fully God and fully man, uses divine powers to overcome the enemy in this temptation. In fact, that is just what the enemy wanted him to do. 
It's certainly the case that Jesus had nothing in his nature that would give Satan a foothold. And when speaking to his disciples in John 14.30, Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. However, these temptations were real just the same. Temptation involves the will, and Jesus came to do the Father's will. We have recorded in the Gospels a selection of uh, three of the temptations he faced. Not all of them, though. There, there were surely many more, and in none did Jesus stumble. The specific temptations that the devil used are not presented in Mark. Again, Mark is a faster-paced gospel. Um, but if you want to go and read about those temptations, you can go to Matthew 4, you can go to Luke 4. You can also go to YouTube or the podcast app, and you can watch or listen to the way that I taught through those particular uh, chapters. But first, um, so we'll move on. Um, we'll move on here in Mark. But I do want to give, a, give you a little, a little application of this event from Jesus' life. Um, you know, Satan loves to plant seeds of doubt because if we allow doubt to take root, it will eventually become a wedge in our relationship with God. So be careful what you allow into your mind. I have to be very, very careful about the Christian books that I read and the podcasts I listen to. Um, and there, there are many podcasts, Christian podcasts, that I listen to that I listen to once and then I, nope, can't do that. Because they, they start out, or they, they start to steal the, the peace that I have, the Lord. And, and they say things that, 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 that agitate the assurance that I have. Seeds of doubt can come from many, many places. When growing up, many times it comes from uh, friends or, or relationships that we make. When we're in college, it often comes from the professors or from the course books. When at home, it can come from the television. I've seen small doubts grow into icebergs that are large enough to sink Christians. And by sink, I don't mean cause to to lose their eternal salvation. I mean cause to stumble. No Christian can forfeit, no believer can forfeit their saved standing with God. You cannot demerit that which you never merited in the first place. At the same time, you can grow discouraged. I myself, I battle discouragement a lot. And, you know, I'm certainly not the only pastor that, that grows discouraged. But, In my case, I I am certain I have a calling from God and I cannot carry out that calling well if I allow myself to stay discouraged or to get involved in things that cause me to be discouraged. So usually if I recognize that what I'm reading or watching is is bringing discouragement, um, after a little while of pouting, I, I hand it over to the Lord in prayer. Because I can only depend on Him, and should I, and I should. I mean, we all should only depend on the Lord. And I know that we all, each one of us here, faces discouragement. And and some of the discouragement that you guys face is way beyond my little belly aching over, you know, small little things. I mean, some of you in this congregation, I know for a fact, have have faced life-changing events and are facing life-changing events, life-threatening events. And I've watched the Lord faithfully carry you through them. Others of us are struggling terribly mentally and probably quietly because we feel like these are our own battles that we have to fight. But you know, the Lord is always available. You can always go to Him in prayer. Prayer is a a tool, a weapon that is always available to you. And prayer with fasting, that is powerful. 
There's also great encouragement to be found in Scripture. So you might, when you find yourself in these spots, open up the Bible and read. I would counsel you against just flipping through the pages and putting a finger down on a verse and saying, that's it. Don't do that. But consider what God says in His Word. and Let it encourage you. When the author of Hebrews wrote to the church about their persecution and discouragement, he urged them not to neglect meeting together. Share your struggles with one another. Share your struggles with your church. They can support you. and They can pray for you. The fact that we see Jesus here going into the wilderness to face the temptations of Satan alone is not instructive toward us to do the same. He is Jesus the Messiah. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to face temptation from Satan alone. Jesus also went to the cross alone. His disciples ran in the garden and even denied knowing him and hid away in fear. But as a result, we don't have to face anything alone. With Jesus' resurrection and ascension to heaven, the church was born. We have one another. We should take full advantage of that. I did that the other week. You guys sent me words of encouragement. We have this wonderful, wonderful availability and ability to to minister to one another in church. This fellowship certainly, but there's also an extended fellowship of believers, a lot of help, a lot of encouragement, a lot of wisdom, a lot of prayer. So take advantage of that. But even if we should find ourselves in a situation where we are just unable to do so for some reason, we yet still are not alone because the Lord is near and He is faithful. But then we might listen to Satan saying, did God really say... In other words, we might buy into this idea that is often taught in church that our problem is we don't have enough faith to bring about the good results of the ideal situation that we are looking for. As if biblical faith is is like Luke Skywalker who if he doesn't have if he doesn't know how to use the force just right can't raise the ship out of the swamp waters. But once he's learned how to use the force, there he is raising the ship out of the waters of Octu. I don't know why I'm referencing this. You guys probably have no clue. (laughs) If you're a Star Wars fan, you know. (laughs) But we can fall into this thing where where like like Yoda was disappointed in Luke when when Luke didn't raise the, the ship because he did not know how to to use the force, we can feel like because somehow we have these doubts that that how disappointed must Jesus be in me? You know, when using the picture of a mustard seed, and by the way, I should make this point, faith is not the force, right? We don't, it's, it's, not, it's not this muscle to exercise or to grow. Faith is believing Jesus. Biblical faith is believing the Lord. When using the picture of a mustard seed, Jesus taught that faith does not come in quantities. If you think your faith is small, you don't have to you know, try to somehow muster up more of it. And that becomes really clear when we understand what faith is. Faith is a conviction that something is true. Jesus spoke of little faith and he spoke of great faith, but he never spoke of more faith or less faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. 
and certain of what we do not yet see, such as we see in Hebrews 11. Faith is confidence and persuasion in something God has said. When you are persuaded that something is true, either because God has said or by the supporting evidence, then you have faith in that that truth. Therefore, you either believe something or you don't. And Scripture contains truths, some of which are easy and some of which are difficult. Great faith has nothing to do with the size of your faith. Rather, it's about the difficult truths you do believe. Little faith believes the simple, elementary, and introductory promises of Scripture like God is love. All Scripture is inspired by God. And Jesus' promise that he who believes in me has everlasting life. However, little faith does not believe in the advanced truths, like God will supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory. And if you believe that, then why are you worrying about tomorrow? I worry about tomorrow all the time which means I don't believe it. Great faith believes it. Great faith believes the hard-to-believe truths of the Bible. While little faith is what we might call saving faith that believes Jesus when he says, whoever believes in me has everlasting life, those with great faith believe the Lord when he says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. All who believe are saved. However, the one with great faith will likely be found to have done faithful works and hear Jesus say, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. But even so, if you are are in this building this morning, you are in here in now in dealing with immediate struggles and difficulties. We all are. Great faith makes it much easier to get through this world and its troubles because great faith has our eyes not on our own suffering, but rather to the amazing future that we are promised in the kingdom of the Lord. Tell you what, we're going to stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have had together this morning in your word. We thank you that you are indeed faithful. That your mercy does endure forever. Lord, we ask that you would increase our love for one another. Teach us how to love the way that you love. We ask that you would establish us in all of the the good things. That we be gracious toward one another, merciful toward one another, patient, enduring, kind, long-suffering. Lord, we ask that you would make us perfect in every good work. And that we would walk through our days with this desire to please you, to magnify your name. Lord, each one of us may not have the reach of someone who speaks to thousands, but we all speak to a few. And everyone is important to you. I pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to be living testimonies, both in word and in deed. Lord, we thank you that you are forgiving that you are our healer, that you are our faith.
faithful counselor. And Lord, we ask you would just guide us through each and every day. That we would place ourselves before you, desiring to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory. And use us, however you may, to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to all those in this world. We pray all these things in the precious name of our Savior Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. It's Jesus the Messiah. Everyone said. The object of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is, is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion, these are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in Him will not perish but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in Him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus's faithfulness to his promise. You crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ and God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. 
The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to CalvaryBirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to CalvaryBirmingham.com and select Contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting Donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.